So uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our session titled Let's get you started with high availability and resiliency on Azure. Um, we hope that at the end of our session, everybody will know a little bit more about how to foresee high availability and resiliency in their own Azure environment. But before we go any further, we first of all want to thank uh, the organizers and everyone involved for setting up this event and uh, for allowing us to deliver uh, this session. Of course, also a big thank you uh, to the sponsors because without them organizing such a huge event probably uh, will, would not be possible. And let me also shortly introduce myself uh, for the people who don't know me. Uh, my name is Wim Thijssen. I live in Belgium where I work as an Azure Technical Advisor. I'm also a Microsoft Certified Trainer and an Azure MVP. And next to that, I'm also a founding board member of a Belgian user group called uh, MC2MC. I also have my own blog, httpswematess.com, where I blog a lot about my daily experiences with Azure and all related Microsoft uh, hybrid cloud services. And like most IT people these days, um, I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn. So if you ever want to reach out, ask a question, or yeah, just want to say hi, uh, you can always contact me through my Twitter handle or through link LinkedIn. Or to make it simple, you can simply scan the QR code uh, at the bottom of the screen. And I will now let Carl uh, introduce himself. Yeah, thank you, Wim. Allora, buongiorno a tutti e spero che vada tutte bene. So that's the only Italian I, uh, I know. Uh, my name is Carl de Winter. Uh, I'm also an Azure MVP and I work as a cloud solution architect at uh, Dexmark, that's a Belgian company. And I uh, run the uh, Belgian user group that's called Tech9. And you can find me on Twitter or LinkedIn, or you can read my blog also uh, if you will. So uh, to start on our agenda today, first of all, we will look at what uh, availability and resiliency in Azure really is. Um, we will also look into uh, auto scaling and data replication and how you can foresee high availability and resiliency on the networking level. Um, we will we'll also show uh, some short demos and before closing off, uh, we hope we still have some time for a Q&A where we would love to answer any of your questions. And otherwise, like Carl and myself already said, you can always contact us through Twitter and ask your question later on. So Carl, I think you can go ahead. Eh? Yeah, so if we think about availability, uh, availability is defined as the, as the proportion of available services in the total number of services. So that means that we can, yeah, we can see the availability as, as, a, as a quality criteria and a sort of measure for a specific uh, system that you have, an application, a service, and so on. So in the upcoming uh, sections, we will uh, we will explain all the different um, methodologies and things that you can do to have some availability options uh, in your Azure environment. Uh, so we need to think about how we are going to do plant maintenance, how we are going to handle the, the errors, if there is something uh, wrong with your application, or we also need to take into account the repair time that we need to, for example, eliminate errors and also uh, damage. So um, when you look at the availability, it is quite important you also know what an SLA is. Uh, well, an SLA is a contract between you and your cloud service provider, which in case of Azure, of course, is Microsoft. And this SLA will guarantee you, you a certain degree of availability for the services you use. Um, so it describes Microsoft commitment for each Azure product uh, uptime and its connectivity. Um, as a last together with availability is described like you can see on the slide uh, in terms of nines. Um, for example, four nines means 99.99% .99 uptime, um, which translates to, yeah, almost one minute or less of potential downtime per week. Um, the thing you should keep in mind is that your applications or uh, workloads you're using in Azure mostly depend on multiple services. Um, for instance, you're running virtual machines, but it's not only the virtual machines, it's also the storage behind them. And you need to combine all those services together and see um, how their uh, SLAs work together because they can have different ones. So that's an important thing you should really keep in mind. So if you then, for example, look at the SLA of uh, Azure VMs, 
Um, you can see that there is an SLA for a single instance virtual machine, which is different depending on the disk type you use. Um, those SLA's connectivity numbers range from, uh, like you can see, 95% until 99.9%. Um, just know that this is a financial back guarantee uptime SLA, um, where you only get your money back in the case you submit the claim. So you need to do something yourself also if, if there is a problem or there is some downtime. Um, um, of course, you can also foresee high availability for your VMs, um, which guarantees at least an SLA of 99.95% in case of an availability set and 99.99% in case of uh, when you're using an availability zone. Um, of course, there are also SLAs for all kinds of Azure services. So if you want to look at, into them, you can uh, use the link on the bottom of the slides and uh, yeah, investigate and look further uh, through the services you're using. Yeah, next, uh, let's talk about Azure resiliency. And on the next slide, um, yeah, if, if, we, if we look at resiliency and Azure in total, we can mainly talk about three things, three topics and three possibilities here. So you have the possibility of high availability. So things are built in into the, into the Azure platform, but next to high availability, you can also have backup or disaster recovery in place. And those topics will be highlighted by Wim, but make sure that you know that um, next to Azure backup, next to Azure site recovery, you can use uh, built-in services to, yeah, to pro to make sure that your uh, that your complete environment is uh, is high available, and on the next slide, uh, I want to tell you a little story because uh, Wim and I both know those two guys. So those are uh, friends of us that are running uh, different data centers. So they are managing different data centers, and luckily for them, they had good resiliency. They they had good uh, designs of high availability in place. So when uh, when a hurricane passed by and everything got uh, flooded away so the data center uh, was was yeah full of water they could still smile because of yeah the the design that they made they had uh, the, yeah they had good backups they made sure that their applications were running in, uh, in in different data centers so for that make sure that you don't end up uh, like these guys in in the water but make sure that you can smile uh, at least when your applications are uh, are doubled into different regions different data centers so like i already said availability is one of the elements of uh, azure resiliency sorry that's one click too fast um, in case of your Windows and Linux VMs, so if you're running EAS, uh, you can foresee high availability, like I already said, by use of an availability set. Um, you simply can see an availability set as a logical grouping um, for isolating your VM resources from each other uh, when they are deployed. Um, this will ensure you that during planned or even unplanned maintenance, at least one of those virtual machines will stay available. Um, in the back, these VMs will be spread across different fault and update domains. Um, you can see a fault, update, uh, fault domain is essentially a rack of servers, and you can see an update domain as um, hosts that will be updated together. So the Hyper-V hosts in the Azure data centers, um, they will yeah, be updated, uh, separated from each other. So at least one of your VMs placed in an availability set will stay up. So um, to foresee resiliency for the ASP VMs, um, you should at least place all your uh, production workloads in a separated availability set. Um, like you can see on the screen, you can have an availability set for your domain controllers, uh, one for your web servers. Um, if you're still running SQL uh, on the ASP VMs and you set up a SQL always on, you can also place that in a separated one. And yeah, you can even think on every other workload um, you're using in your environment. And for complete redundancy until the storage level, um, in the case of an available managed, you should always use managed sticks for the VMs you place in such an availability set. So uh, also keep uh, that one in mind. So Azure makes sure that, that your VMs placed within an availability set runs across multiple physical servers and network switches. Um, all in their own compute racks uh, with their own storage and their own power units. Um, so if a hardware or software failure happens, um, only a subset of your VMs are impacted and 
like I already said, your overall solution uh, will stay operational. Um, so you can see availability sets are essential for building a reliable uh, cloud solutions if you're using uh, EAS, um, which will ensure that at least one of the VMs will be available um, if something happens, like, for example, those guys in the water, they were <laughs> flooded, or like a hardware malfunction, uh, and this in a single data center. So next to availability sets, you can also place your VMs uh, these days in an availability zone, um, which is the next level to foresee Azure Virtual Machines high availability, um, because all VMs in an availability zone will be placed in a different physical location within a specific Azure region. And this physical separation will protect those workloads um, from any data center failure. So if a complete data center drops, um, your VMs will be running because yeah, they're separated over those different ones. Um, just keep in mind that availability zones don't support all uh, VM SKUs. So when you design it, first look at that and see if it's possible. And otherwise, yeah, our advice would be if it's if it's a go, uh, start using availability zones in the place instead of an availability set. It's the higher level. Yeah, and if you look at building resiliency for applications, then uh, you should know that that on Azure it's uh, yeah it's a shared responsibility. So Microsoft is responsible for the reliability of the of the cloud platform itself, and that's including the the global network and the data centers and so on. Uh, but yeah, as a customer, you are responsible for the for the reliability of uh, of your own cloud applications. So, and those applications yeah, need to need to use the the best practices based on the requirements of each workload. So, customers need to uh, yeah they need to use the design architectures and best patterns and try to make as as much as possible um use of the built-in resiliency options uh, of the platform and on the next slide we can see that we sh we show here and an, yeah, and that's an example of an application that you can build with high availability in place so as Wim already told you can yeah you can scale out so that's scaling horizontally adding more adding smaller instances of your application of your workload and scaling up means that you scale vertically so for example make one resource bigger and that's the same that you can do here in uh, as, as this example application you can for example make use of of sql database but enable the geo replication of your uh, databases so that they are geo aware and geo replicated between different uh, regions and then you can have if you have a main entry point of your uh, web app for example you can um, have that one in an active region and just put uh, another web app in another region and make that uh, a standby region or a standby application. So in that way, you can have some sort of load balancer like, like a traffic manager um, to, yeah, to distribute the DNS traffic between those two app service plans. So that's a design here that you can use uh, to make your application resilient. So in another way, another element to foresee resiliency in Azure is uh, via backup and disaster recovery. And in the case of Azure, you have Azure Backup for backup and Azure Site Recovery for uh, disaster recovery. Um, the Azure Backup server keeps your data safe and recoverable uh, by backing it up to Azure. Uh, for example, think of a user deletes a file and you can restore that file, for example or a virtual machine is not responsive anymore and you restore that virtual machine from a backup. Now, Azure Site Recovery, like I already said, uh, Microsoft Azure Disaster Recovery Service um, is something completely different because it replicates your workloads running on physical or virtual machines and this from a primary site to a secondary location. And when an outage occurs, for example, at your primary site, you fail over to the secondary location and uh, access all apps from there or all workloads or VMs. And when the primary location is running again, you can then fail back uh, to the primary location. So you use Azure Site Recovery or Disaster Recovery when a complete data center fails and you don't uh, use it uh, to restore a single virtual machine or even uh, more virtual machines and especially not to recover uh, from any data loss. So let me show you a short demo related to Azure Backup. So I think my Azure portal is showing at the moment. 
Um, so if you go to a recovery search default, uh, we can go from the sidebar or you can use a global search bar, whatever. Um, the nice thing is if you use the global search bar, you already directly have the option to go to all the Microsoft docs related to that specific service. It's a little trick, um, but let me click on it. Um, you can see I have at the moment two recovery service default in place. Uh, one is in West Europe and one is in the East US located. Um, so if I click on that one, you should, an important thing you should remember is if you look at the properties and you go to the backup configuration, you will see there's, you can uh, choose between the storage replication type. Uh, the thing you should really know is uh, from the moment you start backing up any resource, if it's an Azure EAS VM or an Azure Files, you're not able to change the storage replication type anymore. That's a thing we that a lot of customers see uh, yeah, configured wrong in the beginning. So for example, they have production workloads uh, that went to backup and they enabled locally redundant, they start backing up and yeah, that's not enough for them. They want to switch it. Then you completely need to delete your recovery service fault and start all over again. Um, so like you can see, this specific um, recovery service fault has some virtual machines backed up. Um, another thing important if you start backing up is that you enable, go under the security settings. No, not this one. It's um, over here. Nope. Let me close that one. I clicked the wrong one. So that you enable soft delete. It's an extra feature you can add. So for example, someone disables a backup and then it's still recoverable for seven days because Microsoft keeps that one uh, in the back. So always be sure to enable soft delete, not only for your recovery service fault, but you can also, for example, enable it for all your uh, storage accounts these days. So think of that one. It's also a thing that can uh, save your day. A uh, last thing I want to mention is, for example, backup is an important thing. So if you have a lot of Azure EAS VMs running, um, we would advise to at least uh, set up a, a specific policy that uh, Azure Backup should be enabled uh, for all your VMs. So when somebody uh, from a specific department or um, uh, set up a specific VM and deploys it, and it doesn't uh, take a backup in, in, in control, for example, that it will be advised to at least um, add the backup agent on there so it can be backed up and uh, restored whenever it needs to. So Carl, with that being said, I think we can Go back to you. Let me share my screen again. Here yeah. you go. Yeah. So, uh, like I said before, you can you can scale out or you can scale up, but make sure that you yeah that you make use of uh, of auto scaling. So auto scaling, like I said, is built in um, in some of the Azure services. For example, you can have in your Azure App Service, you can enable the auto scaling option. So when your workload is getting bigger and bigger in the background, your resources will scale automatically. Um, and that's that's even for, for uh, most of the Azure resources, even for Azure VMs, but be aware that scaling Azure VMs, yeah, then you need to work with VM scale sets. So before you create your VM, make sure that you create your VM scale set, place those VMs in there, and then you can make use of scaling, your, uh, scaling the VMs uh, in there. Um, and yeah, make sure that you uh, that you are aware of the cost that is coming with uh, with those auto scaling uh, auto scaling options. So, and another important thing uh, to be aware of is that there are uh, different types of data replications you can use uh, within Azure. Um, first of all, most familiar one probably uh, you have local redundant storage or LRS. Uh, which copies your data synchronously three times um, within a specific location in your primary region. Then you have uh, also zone redundant storage, ZRH, which copies your data uh, synchronously across three availability zones in your primary region. And then you also have the choice to choose uh, geo redundant storage or GRS, um, which first copies your data uh, synchronously three times within a single physical location. And this in the primary region using LRS, and then it copies your data asynchronously to a single physical location in a secondary location a region. 
Uh, finally, you also have GeoZone redundant storage, uh, Jet CRS, uh, which copies your data synchronously across, uh, once again, three availability zones in the primary region using ZRS. And then it copies it um, asynchronously um, to a single physical location in a secondary region. Um, with GRS and Jet CRS, uh, you also have the read access option, which allows you to read the data in the secondary location. And um, with this, with showing this, we hope that you see that there are a lot of options you can choose between, um, all with different prices and availabilities. Um, so also for us, it's an important factor to keep in mind when you start designing any new solution. So definitely look at all those and see which ones you need. And yeah, choose the, the, the good one because it's quite difficult if you set it up to change it afterwards. So um, also keep that in, one, in mind whenever you design something. So and then it's up to networking design and management related to high availability resiliency. And I think Carl will tell yeah. you everything about an Azure Load Balancer. Yeah, now. correct. So the Azure Load Balancer, that one delivers high availability and also network performance to your application. So the Load Balancer will distribute the, the inbound traffic to, an, uh, to a backend resource. Um, and it, it is using load balancing rules and also health probes to check if the VMs are uh, running or not, or if the, if the service is responding. And important to know is that the Azure Load Balancer is working at the layer four of the, uh, of the OZ model. Um, and you can have, or you have load balancing rules, but also health probes, like I said, and the load balancer, the, yeah, it can be used for uh, for inbound traffic, but also for outbound scenarios. Um, good to know is that you can have an, uh, a pu public load balancer. So that one maps the public IP address and also the port number of incoming traffic to, to a backend, so to a private IP address, and that's port number uh, of a specific VM and also uh, the other way around. Um, and it's by applying load balancing rules that you can distribute specific types of traffic uh, across multiple VMs. Um, for example, you can spread the load of incoming web requests that are uh, needed to go to a uh, specific or across multiple uh, web servers. And next to the public load balancer, you also have the internal load balancer. And that one is, uh, yeah, that, that one directs only traffic to specific resources that in, that are inside a specific virtual network, or for example, you can use VPN to access an, an Azure infrastructure from on-prem, um, and then yeah, you can uh, you can have connection to that uh, directly. Yeah, so let me share my screen, and I need to ask then at the producers to uh, to switch screens. Um, you should see my screen now. So I'm sharing my uh, my Azure portal, and as you can see, I will show you. Um, I made a little uh, setup here, so I have an internal load balancer, and that internal load balancer is uh, is listening on a private IP address. So it has not a public IP address, but only a private IP address. So that means that um, I can have. Uh, different VMs as a backend of my load balancer. So I have two simple web VMs and one SQL. So I have a database and two web VMs. Those web VMs need to connect to that database, but I'm, I, I am placing those two web VMs uh, behind the load balancer. And as I've told you, you can have a backend pool and in a backend pool, you can place multiple VMs. So that means that those private IP addresses will not be used, but only be used by the load balancer. So the traffic is hitting the front end IP address and then based on some load balancing rules, like you see here, I have only one rule that is, uh, that is, yeah, taking the HTTP traffic on port 80 and then sending it to the um, to the backend pool. So one of my VMs will listen if I go to an uh, to another server. Uh, and if I go to the IP address of my uh, load balancer, then you will see that it is hitting uh, my web 2 virtual machine. If I do some refresh, you will see that it, it switched sometimes to web 1, web 2. For example, if I go to my web 2 and you can see it's just a simple web server. If I stop this one, that means that my uh, HTTP service is not available anymore. 
my uh, load balancer should pick that up and it should only go now to web one and not hitting web two uh, anymore because it's uh, it's unavailable. So that's a very, very simple demo. But um, like you see here, uh, like you see here with uh, yeah, with, with the simple load balancer, two, two backend VMs that are web VMs installed on a Windows server, IIS role is installed. You can make your uh, application high available. So that was the demo. Uh, I will stop presenting now so you can take over Wim. Yep. So let me share again. So here we go. Let me take the deck again. There it is. Okay, here we go. So um, after looking into the Azure Load Balancer, uh, let us now look into the Azure application. How uh, an Azure application gateway uh, fits in the story? Um, simply said, an Azure application gateway is a web traffic uh, load balancer. Uh, that enables you to manage traffic to your web applications and it operates at layer 7 of the Aussie model. Um, like you can see on the slide, it can make routing decisions based on additional attributes of uh, an HTTP request, uh, which can be, for example, a new read part or it can be a host header. Um, and for example, this will allow you to route traffic based on the incoming URL um, and next to that, it will, for example, also redirect uh, your traffic, which you can help you, for example, to enable automatic HTTPS to HTTPS redirection. So like you saw in the demo of uh, Carl, he was using HTTP, but if you want to uh, add HTTPS in the back, uh, you can use the application gateway and anyone who uses HTTP will, re will be redirected by the application gateway to use uh, HTTPS. Um, if you enable application gateway, it protects your uh, web applications also from uh, common exploits and vulnerabilities, and this through uh, the Azure Web Application uh, Firewall or shortly set uh, the WAF. Um, so if you want to use that one, it's an extra addition on, on top of the application gateway. You simply enable that one and um, you will be protected to, uh, against a lot of uh, security threats already. Yeah. Um, next is Azure Frontor. So Azure Frontor is used for also web traffic, uh, but you have to know that uh, on the next slide we will see that Azure Frontor is a global service and it's also used for uh, yeah, for failover or for high availability. So Frontor also works at layer seven. So that means that um, yeah, the, the HTTP or HTTPS application traffic uh, it's it's used on that layer and it uses split TCP based any cost protocol, but that's uh, maybe too technical, but you, you have to know that Frontor ensures that uh, the end user connects to the to the nearest Frontor pop and a pop is a, is a, a point of presence in the global Azure network. So you always connect to the nearest point and then from there on you can uh, you can get uh, get the connection to your uh, to your backend and an application backend can be any internet facing service hosted inside but also outside of Azure, of Azure. So you can connect to for example an on-prem VM via the uh, the Azure front door uh, service. So it uh, yeah, it provides also a, a range of traffic routing methods. You also have the backend health monitoring options, um, and you can of course do the uh, do the automatic uh, failover. So good to know is that we can also enable uh, the web application firewall. It can also do path based routing like when sit uh, as the application gateway. But the main difference here is that Azure Frontor is global, so you can operate at different regions with the application gateway you stay within one region and you can load balance between different uh, availability zones if you will so and next to uh, the azure load balancer the application gateway and the azure front door we also have uh, azure traffic manager um, azure traffic manager is a DNS based uh, traffic load balancer that enables you uh, to distribute uh, traffic optimally to services also across global Azure regions. Um, therefore, it uses DNS um, to direct the client's request. So if you make a request to the appropriate service endpoints and uh, it will base these on uh, traffic routing methods. Um, 
This endpoint uh, can also be any internet facing uh, service hosted inside of outside of Azure, just in the same way as uh, the Azure front door service does it. Um, and for example, it can help you in the case you have, for example, plant maintenance and you want to drop down something, um, it will control it and it will uh, follow the DNS path to do another way. Um, and you can, by this, it can do, you can do your maintenance without uh, downtime of any of your applications or all the workloads uh, that you're running. Uh, it does this by directing the traffic to the alternative endpoints um, while the maintenance is in progress and while the other uh, application is back up and running, it can split it over to uh, those two again. Yeah, uh, so next um, to that we have uh, Azure CDN. So in, on the next slide we can see that uh, Azure CDN is the content delivery network. So with that we um, yeah we have uh, a very large scale out uh, environment that you can use to yeah, do not only cache your traffic but also to have um, yeah to have the nearest uh, entry point for your uh, for your website. So for example LinkedIn but also uh, Facebook is uh, is using its own content delivery network. Maybe you've seen that the the Akamai uh, URL redirections that's one of the, the the content delivery networks but Azure has its uh, its own content delivery network on its own and it it is spread across like you see on this slide across all the different uh, points of presence uh, and that means that if you are coming from the US or if you're coming from Europe you will always be pointed to the nearest point of presence and there your uh, most recently used files will be uh, will be cached in, uh, in in that service so that will also reduce the the traffic spikes and 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 also yeah, it will improve the the origin of the traffic so if you're coming from the US you will stay uh, local cached in the US and if you need to catch something from a service that's for example in, in West Europe it will in the back end um, get all those uh, all those information and it will also bring your own cost you can also bring your own custom SSL certificates um, and it uh, it's it's a very nice experience with uh, uh, within the Azure portal and you can have globally um, or you can monitor globally your traffic with uh, with the core metrics. So maybe I can uh, quickly share my screen, Wim, and uh, yep, and, sh yep. and show um, how it looks like in the portal uh, screen too. So if all things are good, you sh should see my uh, my screen yep, here. So sure. if, yep. yeah, if you go to the to the search bar like. Uh, like Wim said, and you search for CDN, you will see that you have, uh, you can uh, see your CDN profiles. Um, and if you open that, you will see that um, that you can create an endpoint, and that endpoint is uh, is that globally unique uh, endpoint that you uh, that you create, and it can have a website or something else in uh, in the back end. So this is for my blog. Uh, I'm using Azure C CDN to uh, yeah, to get to my blog. So uh, if you go to one of those URLs, you first hit the Azure CDN, which is uh, having my certificate, and then in the back end, it's it's routing to um, uh, to my my hosted blog. So my blog is yeah basically a, a storage account with with a, with a static side on it. So that's in the back end that uh, that is uh, hosting this one. So you can have different uh, features here um, for the uh, for the CDN, but uh, yeah, I'm using the the Verizon one. So you have an, an external party that is also committing to the uh, to the global network, and that is using uh, the global network, and that is what uh, what the Azure CDN is uh, is is using. So that's a very quick demo, Wim. Yeah. Uh, back to Maybe you. you have some time, um, Carl, to show. You can share your screen. Um, there are two free services that can really help you uh, with high availability and yeah. uh, keeping control of your environment. And I think if you open, for example, the Azure Advisor call, yes, you can see it's made up of uh, five dashboards that can really help you. You have uh, cost uh, that can help you with cost optimization. You have the security one, but the one we want to focus on is the one with the rel reliability. And you can see uh, Carl at the moment has one recommendation. So <laughs> like I said, 
with the soft delete, that's something we see at a lot of companies. Um, so, for example, Carl has some uh, storage accounts, I think. He didn't enable soft delete. Mm -hmm. And Azure Advisor will uh, inform and make a recommendation that he should enable it. Uh, it's a quick win, but if he clicks on it, uh, on the recommended action, it probably will be redirected to the storage account where you can simply enable it. Yeah. Um, you can see, you can do it, you can click on it, you can save it, and uh, yeah, even change the soft delete, uh, choose a, a number of days, and that's it. So it's a free service, it's available in Azure. Uh, we would advise to use it. Um, next to Azure Advisor, for example, um, you also have Azure Service Health. So maybe you can open that one, Carl. Yes. Um, so if you click on that one, and for example, you have 50 VMs running in an environment, and um, they're all separated in different availability sets. You have some in availability zones, but from time to time, um, at least once a year this time, uh, Microsoft will do also some maintenance uh, in their data centers. Um, so they will upgrade their uh, Hyper-V host, for example, from 2016 to 2019 or from 2019 to 2022 now, and the new version, it's still in preview. Um, so if you want an easy way to see which of your VMs will be uh, placed into uh, the plant maintenance cycle, um, you can simply open Azure Service Health, uh, click on the plant maintenance button, if you go a little bit up, Carl, um, you don't have at the moment. And no. from here, you can simply choose um, to reboot or re-host. Eh? You will be redeployed to another host uh, when maintenance is. You can do it in your own uh, maintenance window. And after a month, it will. Uh, yeah, you can still see it, but it will be placed in a Microsoft maintenance window. So then you don't have any control anymore in, about it. Um, another feature is um, if some yeah, problems are affecting uh, the Azure Backbone, for example, an easy way to uh, look at it. So if you ever have a problem with a specific service, we also would advise to uh, open um, Azure Service Health, look into the service issues. Uh, Microsoft will describe what's happening in the back, um, um, how they solve it and when it's solved. Uh, so for example, you're a, a partner who's managing a uh, managed service for a customer, for example, and you need to inform the customer why yeah, their solution or why their workload is down. You can simply download the PDF or uh, use it in any other way. You can mail it and you can follow it up from here. And next to that, you also some, have some health advisories and security advisories. You can click on service health, um, easily look at, uh, instead of looking at the resource separately, you can look at all resources from a specific, um, like your virtual machines. If something is wrong with any of your virtual machines, it will pop up here. Um, for example, Carl has some issues probably. Yeah. He will uh, stop these VMs eh? like you mostly do yeah. for uh, cost optimization, and you can see it from over here. I think, Carl, we can uh, round up from yeah. here. If okay, you still want so... to mention something, we still have, I think, five minutes, but yeah, yeah maybe yeah, we can uh, go to a QA. Yeah. So let me share my screen again. It's not showing. Okay, there it is. So I think with this, um, yeah, we still have some time for a Q&A. So uh, if you have any questions or there are any questions in the chat, uh, we're happy to answer them. And otherwise, if you have some questions later on, uh, yeah, just contact us through our Twitter handles and we're always happy to answer the, all, any of them. So I don't know if there's some in the chat at the moment. Did you already looked at them, Carl? If they I were don't some? see. Yeah, I don't see nope. nothing in. I don't know if nope. that's the live chat or not. <laughs> um, does any of the attendees has a question? He can unmute himself. I think if it's possible, maybe uh, the presenter needs to do it because we can't do it. I think. Um, yeah. So I think with this, we can just say. Um, let me take the slide deck again. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we really hope you enjoyed our session and that you learned something new. Um, so if you want to reach out, have a question later on, um, yeah. our Twitter handles are on there. Um, also, you can simply scan the QR code. It's an easier way to do it. And then we can simply say thank you to uh, the organizers, thanks everybody for joining and thanks uh, to all sponsors to make uh, this event possible, I think.
Yeah, I can see one question in the live okay. event q and I don't know if it's published yet, but uh, the question was if it's possible to set a CDN for, for example, video streaming contents. And yeah, for sure, you can use uh, Azure CDN to uh, to stream or to host your uh, streaming contents. So it, it, it is made for that. So not only for static images or static sites like I'm using for my blog, but also for uh, high streaming or high uh, yeah, media streaming optimization. So for that, you can for sure use uh, Azure CDN. Uh, you just have to look which uh, SKU you want to use. Uh, like I am using not the Microsoft SKU, but the Verizon SKU, and that's some part of, of the of the SKUs that you can choose. Um, but you have just, yeah, you, you have a lot of more capabilities there. So you need to, you need to have a look at the different, uh, yeah, the different possibilities. Uh, with the different pricing tiers that you can have for Azure CDN, but for sure you can uh, use Azure CDN for uh, video streaming contents. Yeah. So, and I think if uh, some of the moderators don't have any questions for us, I also want to thank uh, everybody for uh, for attending, listening. Also, want to thank the sponsors, and I hope you have uh, yeah. You have an, a nice day ahead at this uh, conference and I hope you uh, enjoy the other sessions as well. See you next time. Bye. See you next time. Bye.